Hello and welcome to another episode of Ultra Fuel. Today with me, AJ. This weekend, I'm here in Ireland and I'm testing the new Audi Q7. It might be a facelift, but there's a lot more technology and the design is also quite different. We have with us the 55 TFSI in the Matador Red and the S-Line trim. And we'll take a quick look at this and drive this as well so we can draw a little bit of a comparison between the diesel and the uh, petrol versions of the Q7. So let's find out what this SUV is all about. Are you ready? Come on, let's go. The new Q7 really hasn't changed much in terms of size because it's on the same platform as before. So it is still 1.97 meters wide and about 5.06 meters long. But what is different, of course, you'll immediately notice up front is the design. You get LED lights as standard now, and you can also get the matrix LED as an option and the laser light as an option like we have here, denoted by that really angular arrow-shaped blue decal along the side. The LED daytime running light signature is also quite different. They're all animated and they're very beautiful to look at. And this does have its own identity as compared to the Q8. It is one very long singular headlamp unit, whereas in the Q8 we have two um, separate elements. Large intake, which is cosmetic and blocked off, but depending on the version you have, this is functional. So like in the TFSI, this would be an intake. Um, Further up, you will find the new octagon grille that we see in the Q8 as well. Very, very pronounced and very large with these vertical aluminum inlays along the front. This car has a lot of sensors, over 22 sensors, which provides a total of around 30 assistant systems. Again, from the platform siblings that we've seen before, but it's good to see that technology coming back to the Q7. The logo is also three-dimensional because the scanners as you can see are housed around the grill. Down here this is not the S-line so we have a fairly simple subtle lower uh, section of the bumper. Overall the lights and the grill are the main differences from before. At the side first of all the wheels are available from 18 inches, but you can get the optional 20 inch rims and even up to 22 inches if you so prefer. We have 20 inch wheels, uh, which look pretty nice and fill the wheel arch really well, but also give you sufficient amount of sidewall in the tire to give you a more comfortable plush ride. The suspension is also available in three different options. As standard, you get Steel's coilover springs, but you can get the optional air suspension. Then you can take it one step higher and get the adaptive air suspension with the anti-tilt function, wherein you have a split anti-roll bar, and suppose you're going around the left-hand corner, then the, outside, the inside wheels will be pushed down, or rather, so the outside wheels will be pushed down, and then it will help prevent the car from leaning over too much. So a pretty useful feature to have for a big 2.2-ton SUV like this. Um, but in terms of the design on the side, the main highlight is what they've done in this section over here to kind of give the new Q7 a more SUV stance. They have this really interesting kink in the middle of the side skirt area. And this kink, as you can see over here and over here, is designed to visually lift the car and visually give the effect of having more ground clearance than it really does, along with this aluminum strip on the top. Um, so it does kind of help, breaks the monotone color and kind of give that uh, emphasis of height in this car. Blacked out wheel arches, as you can see, and very clean lines, a little bit of a haunch over the shoulder on the wheel arch. The track has also been increased ever so slightly, again, to give a more planted, powerful stance for the new Q7. Chrome frame for the window, and unlike the Q8, a roof line which continues fairly high and fairly straight all the way to the back. The rear axle can also be had with the rear axle steering, which means that at low speeds, the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction as the front wheels to effectively shorten the uh, turning radius of the car, which is really useful when you want to maneuver this long vehicle in tight European city 
car parks at least. And also, the air suspension can raise and lower the car by a total of nine centimeters, which is really useful when you want to go off-road and you don't want to scrape the bottom of the car on that, you know, the nasty rocks and stuff like that. Here at the back, I think this, uh, the new Q7 has a good amalgamation of the previous version and the new because, you know, from this angle, this area looks quite similar to the old version. Very Q7, it's, it's very, um, you know, it has that identity instantly recognizable. But the tail lamps are quite slim now. They're also animated and cascading. I mean, the lights are a very big uh, upgrade from the previous version with all the animations and the LED. Even the Q8 doesn't have the laser light, for example. There's a very subtle spoiler at the top. Again, since this is not the S-Line, aggression and sporty looks is not what this SUV is trying to achieve. So it's a little bit more subtle, more simple. Clean lines along the top of the hatch. A very long horizontal strip of aluminum along the bottom of the, or the middle of the boot lid to try to emphasize the width of the new SUV. Cameras in the back, more sensors down here. Q7 and the Quattro badging. And what we always love to talk about, exhaust tips, or lack thereof in this case. And down here, well, I don't even know if you could even call these fake exhaust tips because it doesn't even, it's barely even trying to be an exhaust tip. There's just a little bit of a, this outline which mimics an exhaust tip, but it's just purely cosmetic. And even this diffuser-like lower section of the bumper is just more cosmetic anyway. This is something that we're used to. I mean, we can complain as much as we want, but take it or leave it. Let's take a look inside the trunk get an automatic tailgate. The Q7 can be had with either five seats or seven seats, and depending on the version you have, you get a lot of trunk space, from 865 liters all the way up to 2,050 liters. With the seven seat configuration and the last row of seats up, there is not that much of space, but there is enough to fit a um, overhead cabin baggage, standard airline size, you know, within this width itself, so you can have plenty of, uh, at least a couple of them on the back. There are nice scuff plates here as well, also with a nice damped um, spring-loaded uh, latch. So the small attention to de detail is something that I always like um, in, in, in cars. The lip is also not that high, but another advantage of having the air suspension is that you can lower the SUV, as you can see right now, I can sit down to show you in more detail. <laughs> it can be lowered, and in that way, it's easier to haul your items in. Of course, you can tumble the third row of seats automatically with these two switches on the side, and now you have a lot more space. It's also useful that they fold completely flat. There's a lot of other useful features, such as LED lights along the side, a 12-volt power socket, you have these adjustable clamps on these railings and you can use this um, barrier to separate items so that things are not rolling around inside. Let's take a look under the hood. By the way, the hood is charged with a pneumatic strut so it goes up automatically, some insulation on the top as well. You have a choice of petrol and diesel engine options. They're all three liter V6 turbocharged engines. The diesel starts with a 231 PS or metric horsepower version and then also a 286 PS version like the one we have here. The TFSI, the turbo petrol V6 engine makes 340 horsepower. They're all coupled with the 8-speed Tiptronic torque converter auto box and of course have the Audi Quattro system. Like I mentioned earlier, depending on the suspension, you can get either steel coilovers, you can get the air suspension there are the sport air suspension with the active tilt uh, stabilization, rear axle steering as well. So plenty of options in the drivetrain, in the chassis, and the powertrain. Furthermore, these are all mild hybrid systems, but the petrol engine will also be coming with a full plug-in hybrid system later on in the future. So the mild hybrid system basically means that the electric alternator starter helps the engine be a little bit more efficient. It doesn't directly drive the wheels, so it helps with having a longer coasting capability and drives the ancillary systems and things like that to slowly and uh, somehow improve the fuel efficiency. So 
First of all, because this is the TFSI, it has a 3-liter V6 turbo petrol engine, and you can see right away that both the intakes on the left and the right-hand side of the bumper are actually functional, whereas in the diesel, only one was functional and the other one was cosmetic. With the S-Line as well, you get a different shade of gray along the edges of the bumper to make it a little bit more athletic and a little bit more sporty. On the side as well, not much is different except a little S-Line badge. This car also is riding on 21-inch wheels with a little bit of a different design. Towards the back of the Q7 SUV, in this trim, you also have, for example, these exhaust pipes. First of all, they're fake, they're cosmetic, but unlike the one in the diesel, they do go inside a little bit. They're a little bit more concave, whereas the one on the diesel was just really a C-shaped cosmetic trim element. But apart from this, the S-Line, um, when this version that we have, is also riding on the sport air suspension, which means that it's already a little bit lower. So the engine is a little bit different, the suspension is a little bit different, but the drivetrain and the chassis are quite similar. So the key fob is fairly standard. Um, of course, this has the keyless entry, so it's locked. You come close to it, the door unlocks automatically. You can also get a soft close function, so you can ensure that even if your kids are trying to close the door and they don't have enough force, the doors will always be secured. The door opens fairly wide. It is pretty hefty, so it gives you a good feeling of solidity. The materials are also very plush on the inside of the door. Soft materials on the top, really nice finishing. A wood inlay, which I always like. I think wood just makes the interior of a car feel a little bit more cozy than just having carbon fiber and metal. There's also nice Alcantara material and overall everywhere, except for down here where the plastic starts to get a little bit harder, you have really good materials. Of course, the door handle is also aluminum and there is a nice door pocket where you can store water bottles. Talking about the seats, you have four different options. The base actually starts with, uh, comes with fabric and I think that would also be a good option. You can be a little bit more kinder to animals and save a little bit of money, but you also get uh, full leather seats, you get sports seats, and you can even get sports seats with integrated head restraints. And I really wouldn't recommend that. Um, just going by the stance of, and the, the overall feeling of this car being more comfort oriented. Of course, if you have the SQ7 or the SQ8, there's, that's a different story. But I think um, either the fabric seats are probably good enough. There's multiple ways of adjusting it. You can even get massaging seats, ventilated seats, and heated seats as well. The seating position is nice and tall, upright. Getting inside is also very easy, thanks to this being an SUV, of course. The seating position can be altered very easily, thanks to this fully adjustable seat, as well as an adjustable steering column. And right here, it's manual, but you can also get this automatic. And then you can have things like uh, ease of access when you get in and out, the steering wheel can move out of the way. Some small features like that. But the biggest talking point, and what is really nice now for the new Q7, is this infotainment uh, system and this virtual cockpit. So hop inside and let's take a closer look. Well, first of all, <laughs> like I mentioned, you're going to notice this new technology, this, this 12.3 um, virtual cockpit, this 10.1 inch display. This is an option, you get a smaller one, but I think you should just go out and get this option because it's really useful. And down here you have a 8.6 inch touchscreen and they work in harmony and they're really intuitive. I think so far this year, this system is one of my favorites. There's also a head-up display, and uh, that gives you useful information such as the speed limit, uh, the, the adaptive cruise assist, and navigation instructions, things like that. The steering wheel is fairly large, but it's not too large, so I think it's a pretty decent size um, for this vehicle. That octagon that we saw in the front grille is also mimicked here on the steering wheel, and I think that's a nice, uh, cohesive design language that they have. And these, these shapes and angles also you can see, uh, you know, mimicked and mirrored, like for example here on the top of the cowl. 
This infotainment, uh, sorry, the virtual cockpit means that you have a lot of flexibility in what you want to see. If it's the full map, which is a Google satellite view map, or you want the navigation, you want to have your telephony, uh, your phone connection, um, the music, for example, and if you want to have the uh, driving data. By the way, we're getting about 9.7 liters for 100 kilometers, but uh, on a much more lighter foot driving on the highway, I know that we've tested this before. You can see numbers around 8.2 quite easily, but we'll test this out later on again once we're driving. This also gets um, the smart cruise assist, which means that you can set the cruise control and it will not only monitor the speed and maintain distance with the car in front, but will also read the speed limit, for example, and will change the speed uh, set by the cruise control accordingly. The steering wheel also has paddle shifters, but like I mentioned for the Q8 and the SQ8 as well, I think in comparison to the steering wheel, they're just not as, you know, as nice to touch and feel and they're not that, um, you know, it doesn't feel like something very engaging to use. I wish they were a little bit more prominent. Further along to the center, air conditioning vents along the top and again, a very straight, cohesive design. Lots of piano black and uh, ambient lighting, which you can change the color of. The, there are LED lights below this, along the side of the center console and the footwells and several places and really give a nice ambience, especially at night. Right now it's a bit too bright, of course, and you can't really see. The main infotainment system is divided into two sections. So this upper section is the main command unit where you have, for example, settings for your car um, and uh, you know, a lot of other things uh, up here. And you can go to navigation. You have this uh, the very nice 3D view, but you can change it to, for example, 2D as well. You have the satellite view if you want. You also have a lot of phone connectivity so you can use Apple wireless CarPlay and Android Auto to connect to your phone because this car is also connected it has a lot of uh, car to X features it can check weather it can check for uh, parking spaces so this car is monitoring its environment continuously and will share the information that it finds with other cars in the network and this is a future ready uh, solution that we can see rolling out to a lot of cars in the Audi range pretty soon. So things like if there's potholes or traffic jams or weather conditions on the road, um, it can relay that to a central server and these cars will talk to each other and tell them about parking spaces and you know other traffic situations and it's a really cool system. It also has um, Amazon Alexa so you can control your Amazon music um, and things like that while you're on the go. But some of the things that I really like, for example, are the combination of how these two systems work. So suppose I want to enter a new location for uh, my navigation. The keyboard comes down here. So I can always, this is not going to be, I'm not going to lose real estate on this. Of course, you have a gesture recognition system mm -hmm. like this, but you can also go directly to a keyboard. And this has that haptic feedback. So every time you press a button, you get a little clicking sound and that really helps um, you know, uh, at least subconsciously feel that you're actually pressing something and you don't get distracted from the road and you're a little bit more safer that way. Down here, this section can be customized. Um, you can add different uh, tiles here for shortcuts, as you can see. Very slick and very intuitive system. But as default, this currently controls your climate control. Here as well, you can easily change the temperature. This also gets... Uh, heated and ventilated seats. You also have seat massagers. Um, so if you press the button on that, uh, on the seat, you can see here, you can have different kinds of massage and intensity. So really advanced system. Further down, um, one thing I don't like, and I mentioned previously with the Q8 as well, is the drive select uh, switch. I wish this was more of either like a rocker switch or a dial. But here it's just these two little, you know, touch sensitive pads. And I think because there's so many different options, as you can see, off-road, all-road, efficiency, comfort, auto, dynamic, and individual, it's really distracting to go through all these different options. And yes, on the steering wheel, you do have a um, star button, which you can program to, you know, control many different things. 
but uh, so far I haven't figured out how to make it control the driving mode and if it's not something that I can figure out in the first five seconds then it's not intuitive enough according to me anyway but on the other hand I do like that there is a physical volume knob and this is also pretty cool because this is on the passenger side so it's very easy it's in reach of the passenger to change the volume control and this is something that I think is better because the driver always has the volume control on the steering wheel anyway this car also has a whole host of driver assistance systems like night vision, distance warning, Audi PreSense, side assist, inter intersection, intersection <laughs> assist, where it will monitor cars coming from, um, you know, if you can't see them across the corner, it has a lot of sensors which can detect that. Um, and also a uh, driver tiredness um, detection system. A lot of assistance systems, a lot of technology, but we've seen this in other cars in this platform like the Touareg and the Q8. And this has a nice little button here where you can jump between maximum, basic, or individual. There's also a three-dimensional uh, 3D rendered uh, camera view as an option again, but I think this is really cool. It renders this car in a 3D uh, space in its surroundings, and it's really useful to use as a, as a, as a way to, you know, uh, navigate through really tight, narrow, off-road situations so you don't scrape the wheels or scrape the bumpers anywhere. Down here we have the gear lever. It's also fairly wide so it's easy to keep your hand in when, uh, keep your hand on it when you are trying to, for example, enter your navigation uh, address. But um, there's also the electronic parking brake, auto hold, a couple beverage holders and a 12 volt power socket down here and an inductive phone charger with a couple USB slots down here as well. There's plenty of headroom. I'm 5 foot 8 or 1.7 meters so even without the um, sorry or even with the sunroof I'm sure it'll be quite a lot if you're roughly my size and you can also get this optional dual sun visor which you know extends and I think it's really nice but also there's a second one and I think this is a really simple but really effective solution. Let's take a look in the middle row. The door opens really wide, almost 90 degrees. Thanks to this long wheelbase, the wheel arch is also not really impeding your entry. So it's really easy to get inside or for example, load those isofix, uh, sorry, those child seats um, with the isofix points. The door itself is, again, like we saw in the front, good materials on the top that wooden inlay, which I like, Alcantara and plush materials, a little ashtray and a manually operated sunshade. We can get this automatic if you want with an option. Let's get inside. By the way, this car comes with the Bose audio system, which sounds really great. There, is, uh, there are two more uh, climate zones here in the back. So you have two in the front and two in the back. And again, touch sensitive controls, you can set it automatic. You also can get seat heaters for the outside two seats. The vents are on the side, sorry, in the, in the center console, but also you can get vents on the, uh, the B pillar. The seats are actually really comfortable. The middle of the seats also is not too bad because as you can see, I have a very nice bench. The backrest is a little bit firm and yes, you have a large central transmission tunnel which runs right in the middle. It's f quite wide, but it's fairly low. So there is enough space to share with your co-passengers. So three adults, I think, are going to be quite comfortable. But the seats are also um, on individual uh, railings or tracks. So you can slide each seat forward and backwards like that to liberate more sp space in the back. Each seat can also be reclined so you can find a very comfortable seating position as well. Isofix points for all three seats so you have one, two and three so actually that's pretty interesting. That's I think also very good for large families. You also have a armrest here in the middle with cup holders. Now the question is how's the third row of seats? I've set this uh, seat to roughly how I would sit Comfortably, I'm five foot eight or 1.7 meters. Likewise, this middle row has also been set. I've slid it forward a little bit 
where I would be very comfortable to sit as well. So let's see how the back seat is because to be honest, unlike the X7, the Q7, the third row is a little bit tight. So the seat tumbles down and locks flat. There is a little switch over here or a handle which I can use to release and it's also pneumatically charged, so it goes up on its own. Down here as well, there are switches to flip the rear seat or raise it. So getting access to the rear seat that way is fairly easy. There is a handle for me to use to step in, do a little bit of contortion to sit inside. And already <laughs> this seat is way too back. So in the, in the furthest back position, it is not possible for me to sit. I need to move this forward as well because as you can see, the wheel arches from the rear wheels are coming in. So you're sitting a little bit inside compared to the middle row. But now let's put the seat down. So far, so good. I have a tab here to lift the seat. This is too vertical. Nobody would sit like this. A realistic angle of recline would be perhaps this and I can fit here, you know, so three AJs can sit back to back in this, uh, in this SUV and my knees are really upright though, so there's very little under thigh support, or actually it's non-existent, so my knees are really up, up high and I kind of have to fit one leg under half of this seat, the other leg under this seat and somebody else sitting next to me would also be a little bit tight and you do have to move the middle row forward, it is really not possible for any adults to sit back here if the middle row is all the way in the back. But for short distances, it's not so bad. You have, you have a cup holder and the bench, sorry, the floor is also completely flat. You have some lights. Um, so it's not that bad, but the good news is there are isofix points on, the, on these seats as well. So you have one, two, and all of these three, so five isofix points just here in the back of the SUV. And I think that's a really good um, use for this area is to have children seats because not a lot of seven seat SUVs uh, in, in, in lower segments offer child seats in the back due to rear impact um, uh, regulations. So some of them don't meet the regulations to have child seats in the back. That's why they only have it in the front, for example. Uh, but yeah, for children, I think this would be good enough. Already I can tell you that in smaller cities or in narrow roads and you know these village situations um, the Q7 doesn't really feel that big and that's especially thanks to the rear axle steering so I really recommend that you know if you're gonna spend this much money on a big SUV you can go the extra little bit distance and get that rear axle steering because it really helps make the car a lot more maneuverable in tight situations and tight uh, roads this air suspension is also something I would recommend because it gives this car a really nice, plush, compliant magic carpet ride. On bumpy roads like that, it really soaks up the undulations and doesn't let any of that sharpness filter into the cabin. If you get the anti-tilt function as well, the roll, anti-roll bars are separated and that means that if you hit a pothole or a bump on one side of the car, that shock and that um, undulation isn't filtered or it doesn't transmit to the other wheels of the car. So it maintains a very level ride. It also helps things like, you know, tilting the car forward and backward under acceleration and braking, as well as controlling the body roll around corners. The Quattro is definitely useful, especially when you're going on muddy off-road uh, tracks, because it helps with that traction. Um, but um, yeah, I think the, the Quattro is a tried and tested system so but out here on the open road now let's put it to the test let's uh, put our foot down a little bit the roads are really narrow here and I'm driving a left-hand steering car on the left-hand side of the road so it's a bit tricky as you can see here now we're coming up to a truck and it does feel a little bit tight 
in some, some situations. So there's no getting away from the fact that it is a slightly larger SUV. But the steering wheel is really communicative. It's fairly soft and light, especially in this auto mode. And um, yeah, I think for an SUV that's not trying to be that sporty, this is not the S line, remember, this is not the S7, of course. So it's okay, you know, we don't want something that's always heavy and uh, when the purpose is to be a little bit more relaxed, this kind of a softer steering definitely helps. But um, the suspension, like I was talking about, also means that the vibrations are also much more damped. So the inside of the cabin is really hushed, really quiet. This also comes with the optional acoustic glass. So the windscreen and the side windows are all um, really, really acoustically damped. And that means that the road noise, the tire noise, the wind noise, the engine noise, all of these things are kept out of the cabin. Let's put our foot down. So in the auto mode, yes, it's not the most sporty, but 286 PS or metric horsepower and 600 Newton meters of torque is definitely enough to get this SUV up and moving. The smaller diesel engine, I mean, 231 doesn't make a big difference, but I would recommend you at least go for this 286 horsepower diesel engine. The throttle response in auto mode, like I mentioned, is a little bit dull, but you can go into the drive select mode here and then choose dynamic. And here, the throttle response is a little bit sharpened and the steering becomes a little bit heavier. The gearbox holds the gear for a longer time, so you get all that torque in the middle of the torque uh, curve in the, in the RPM. And the steering also becomes a little bit heavier, the suspension becomes a little bit more firm, and it reacts a little bit more aggressively to keep the body from rolling. So all these little changes help the Q7 tackle corners a little bit better and we can test that out once we get up to some uh, corners up ahead. The visibility is also really good. Large front windshield, tall windows on the side, a large rear window in the, in the back, and this large um, rear view mirror, an outside rear view mirror, gives you really good visibility. Of course, with the touch of a button, you can activate the front camera if you're going at slow speeds. You can even program this uh, steering wheel start button to launch the camera so you can use that to help if you're going on rocks or really close to the curb. The seats are also pretty comfortable so I would recommend you stick to this kind of a seat and not go for the full out and out sport seat because that does get a little bit firm. With this it's soft enough yet supportive, has a lot of um, adjustments with lumbar support, side bolstering for the backrest, for the base, under thigh support and massaging. So you can turn that on with a click of a button here on the bottom of the seat. And it also has things like uh, ventilation and heating. So rain or shine, summer or winter, these seats will keep you comfy. Beautiful straight road. So I can also show you now the cruise control. This also has that really advanced, really nice adaptive cruise assist system, which will do things like, for example, read the traffic signs and then will adapt the speed accordingly. So if you're in a 50 zone and then you go into an 80 km per hour zone, speed uh, cruise control will automatically jump to 80 and will speed you up. And it will also look at the car in front and slow down if you're getting too close to them and maintain a safe distance. It also has steering wheel intervention for the lane keeping assist, which means that on the highway, it also helps you ensure you're in the middle of the lane in case you get a little bit distracted and uh, you start you know, s straying across the lanes, it will bring you in place. Security and safety systems on this car are really great and this platform and this technology that we've seen in some of its siblings, you know, I'm really glad that it's carried over now because I think this stuff is the future and I'm um, looking forward to even lower down in the food chain, the other SUVs and other Audi um, vehicles getting this kind of technology. The head-up display also provides a lot of useful information like the speed limit, the navigation instructions, your media in terms of what song is playing, so you don't really ever have to get your eyes off the road. This adaptive cruise control also does things like look at the navigation and it will see if there's a curve coming up ahead or a roundabout and it will preemptively slow the car down so that it's a much more safer speed to take these corners. 
It's a really smart system um, overall. In the other driving modes, you have, for example, the all-road, which is basically an off-road uh, driving mode where the, the suspension will raise itself by six centimeters and the traction control remains on. If you go to the off-road mode, you get things like hill descent control and the traction control is also in an off-road specific mode. So that way, it will allow a little bit of slip, perhaps, you know, if you're in the mud or sand to kind of dig the wheels down and get more grip rather than having the ESC cut in, the traction, co uh, traction control cut in uh, the engine power too soon. But I think um, the auto mode is where this car really feels at home because it is quick enough, you know, but the auto mode is smart enough to realize what kind of driving scenario you're in and will adjust things like the throttle response and the suspension automatically. And in that way, I think it's a really good balanced system. Because of this mild hybrid system, the engine is also pretty frugal. It does things like coasting. It can shut off the engine and decouple the transmission as you're coming up to a traffic light, for example, or you're going downhill on a highway. And that way, save a little bit of fuel as, as much as it can. Of course, the engine starts stop. And right now it's saying 10 liters for 100 kilometers, but this is a really high number. Uh, we were filming and we were moving the car around, and that's why it was uh, showing a little bit of a higher number. But earlier on today, you know, when I was testing this car on some more steady open road, um, uh, yeah, open roads, I was seeing numbers around 8.2 liters for 100 kilometers, and I think that's a realistic number and a pretty good number for a car of this weight and an engine of this size. Perhaps you can see a little bit better numbers if you're just only using it on the highway, then perhaps it's a little bit lower as well. But uh, the engine, you know, is really quiet now. You can barely hear it. But if you were to go into a lower gear, let's shift down using the paddle shifters. And if I put my foot down, you can hear it a little bit on the inside. It is a V6, so it doesn't sound terrible. It's a diesel so it doesn't sound that great, so you're kind of stuck in the middle. But uh, on the whole, with these paddle shifters, the 8-speed Tiptronic is, I would say, fairly responsive. It's not razor sharp, but um, at the same time, it's not trying to be. This is not even the S line version, or of course not the S7, so everything is tuned for comfort and long distance cruising. Has that big family feel because you can take five adults and two kids, perhaps not seven adults, and it has that off-road, you know, the, the all-wheel drive and the off-road capability, thanks to that suspension which can raise itself and lower itself also, by the way, at higher speeds. So it gives you that kind of adventure feeling that I can take this SUV with my family anywhere, and that way, I think it's a pretty good package. And if you're really looking for a big seven adult seating, luxury German SUV, then perhaps not. Maybe look elsewhere, perhaps like the BMW X7. But you have a lot of technology in this car. You have a lot of luxury. It's really quiet and comfortable. And when you want to push it a little bit, thanks to that active tilt control and rear axle steering, it is pretty fun, but it's not necessarily the enthusiast's choice. I found a nice serpentine road heading down into the coast, so let's kind of push it a little bit. Put it in. Um, dynamic mode and I have the gearbox in the manual setting. I shift down and pass this little uh, section here and then we'll put our foot down. So the 0 to 100 is not necessarily something that's blistering, it's about 6.5 seconds, but I mean because of that torquey diesel engine there's always a lot of push even in the dynamic mode, you can't really hear the engine. There is no sound actuator, so that kind of you know, sonorous engagement you don't really get with this diesel engine. The steering wheel does become heavier, but feedback is not, I wouldn't say, is not that sharp. So it is a little bit artificial, the weight, which um, you know, I've said about this platform in the past, but at least the weight gives you that little bit of extra confidence um, in the handling. But this, this 600 Nm is plenty. I mean, if I slow down and I'm in the right gear, I can really feel an instant shove when I put my foot down. And the engine also seems to be revving quite freely, for a diesel at least. 
So, engine-wise, the powertrain is definitely something that is lively, and it's going to keep you entertained if you know that, okay, what you're buying is not a sports SUV, it's not the S7, but this engine is definitely going to keep you entertained. Wow, gorgeous view on the left-hand side. That anti-tilt function also helps you feel like uh, you know the car is a little bit lighter because 2.2 tons is <laughs> definitely hefty by any standards but that uh, suspension is really smart to mask that weight and that rear axle steering also definitely aids in making this car feel smaller than it is because that that uh, effective wheelbase gets shortened thanks to that rear axle steering you do hear the engine a little bit more now if you rev it up but on the whole it's definitely not that bad at all but for me i think it's really best to leave it in auto and leave the gearbox also in auto and let the car do everything it needs to do and on the whole it's a little bit more comfort oriented but i think that definitely suits the personality of this suv but if you want to have a little bit of fun and push it around corners on your family holiday through the mountains, then it will definitely keep you entertained. We wanted to show you guys another model. So this is the 55 TFSI. It has a 3-liter turbocharged V6 petrol engine, which makes 340 horsepower and 500 newton meters of torque. This 500 newton meters of torque comes in really low down in the RPM, just a little bit over 1,500, and it stays steady for quite a lot more um, after that. So it's pretty torquey engine low down, even though it's a petrol. This car also has um, the S-Line package. So even there, several things are different than the previous version that we were driving but for example the steering wheel is the S Sport S line steering wheel with a flat bottom and a little bit different grip and this also has the uh, active, uh, adaptive air suspension sport so in this the suspension is already lower a little bit and of course it also has the active road stabilization uh, all wheel steering and the quattro of course coupled with a 8-speed Tiptronic torque converter auto box. So primarily the engine is a little bit different in the powertrain. The suspension and chassis and the drivetrain are pretty much similar. And of course some cosmetic elements um, on the outside. So let's put it through the paces. We're on this beautiful coast road um, here in, the, in, in Ireland. I'm going to go into the drive select mode and then go to dynamic. Shift down. There is plenty of torque and it really pushes the car forward. Acceleration is definitely brisk, but it's not blistering. The transmission shifts down pretty, uh, pretty quickly as well. Steering actually is also much heavier now. It gives you good confidence when you're going around tighter corners. The suspension is also a little bit stiffer. You might hear my voice quivering a little bit because of that, but the engine doesn't necessarily sound much nicer there is not a sound actuator so it doesn't really become more sonorous it just you can hear it revving a little bit higher and I wouldn't say it sounds that great it doesn't really sound that sporty but still I think the body control with this active roll stabilization really makes you feel like this car is a lot smaller than it is because with that um, four-wheel steering as well the back rotates around you and it really makes the car feel a lot more agile and really masks that weight if you're driving briskly with a heavy foot this engine is going to be a lot less efficient of course a lot less efficient generally than the diesel engine right now it's saying we're getting about 12 liters for 100 kilometers I haven't been driving too much and I haven't really been driving on the highway so it is a little bit on the higher side but I wouldn't expect it to be much lower than this especially if you're you know driving a little bit more enthusiastically it's going to definitely be over 10 perhaps around 11 but 
I must say, you know, with the nice visibility, this upright seating position, if you want to have a little bit more fun, this, this version, the 55 TFSI with the turbo petrol, is definitely more, is more for the enthusiast than the diesel engine is. But at the same time, you can put this in automatic, you can put the entire driving profile in auto and with the advanced um, adaptive cruise control and this again, this acoustic damping that is everywhere in this car uh, and this air suspension becomes a lot more supple. This also can change into a much more calmer, more comfortable long distance family cruiser and lets you really enjoy, for example, this beautiful coastline like we're driving through right now without um, you know, without being worried because active lane keeping assist, emergency brake assist, all of these safety features really are, you know, give you good confidence and are a good cushion and a safety net to rely on. So definitely there is quite a lot of difference between the turbo diesel engine and the turbo petrol engine. And I would say if you're okay with not having the most, uh, uh, a very frugal car, because let's face it, at the end of the day, no matter what engine you get, it still has to haul around this heavy 2.2 ton SUV. And that mild hybrid system definitely helps and with all the uh, smart systems that it has like coasting and so on. But um, if you're okay with spending a little bit more on your fuel bill every month and you want to have a little bit more fun, this S-Line 55 TFSI is the one to get. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this film. I enjoyed making it. Ireland is fantastic. I mean, look at this fantastic landscape. So, what do I think about the new Audi Q7? Well, with prices starting at around 67,000 euros for the 235 horsepower TDI, the diesel engine, then if you get the more powerful 286 horsepower diesel engine, then you're looking at something around 75,000 euros. And here for the Matador Red, uh, 55 TFSI, the turbo petrol V6 engine, you're looking at something around 80,000 euros. With the S-Line package, the upgraded lights, bigger wheels, and all the extra technology and sunroof, if you keep adding the options, you're easy, easily going to cross 90,000 euros. And for that price, yes, it is a little bit steep, but keep in mind this is the Audi Q7. It's one of the flagship SUVs that Audi makes. So if you consider the, the platform, the, uh, the chassis, the technology, all that really advanced uh, driver assistance systems, which I really like, I think it's, you know, you, one can argue <laughs> that it's not uh, that expensive or it's worth the money and, you know, I don't think it's uh, too, too bad at all. So at the end of the day, I think the technology is great, but if you want a real seven seat family SUV, perhaps this is not going to meet your requirements. The last row is really tight for adults and is only really suitable for short journeys or for kids. Thankfully, at least, it has Isofix points so you can fit child seats in the third row. But if you want a proper seven seat adult seven seater, then you're probably better off with the BMW X7. Between the diesel and the petrol engine, there is quite a lot of difference. I think the petrol is a little bit more sprightly. None of them really sound that great on the inside, unfortunately, but the petrol is a little bit more free revving a little bit more responsive, and hence, with that anti-roll function and the rear wheel steering, the car feels pretty entertaining nevertheless. So, there's a little bit for everybody. That's my verdict. Let me know what you guys think. Put it down in the comments below. Subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you guys next time.